Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I know the, the time slot right after lunch, you know, you got a little bit of a food coma in us, and, uh, and I appreciate you guys. Uh, day, these conferences are long and arduous days, so I uh, so appreciate you joining us, and I'm hearing a few things about what we're doing here with the state of Indiana. Um, my name is Darshan Shah. Um, I have the pleasure of serving as the Chief Data Officer for the state of Indiana. Uh, I've been in the role for about seven months. Uh, my background is not in government. It's in uh, private healthcare organizations. Um, so this is very much a, a departure, but a fun departure for me. And, uh, and it's, it's really exciting to be able to work on really key challenges you know, for the state. Um, I'm accompanied here with, by Josh Martin. Um, he is the Chief of Staff for our Management Performance Hub. Um, and that's the organization that both of us support. Um, so what I thought we'd do is, the, the main focus of this conversation today is gonna be around our efforts around the opioid efforts, uh, opioid kind of um, challenges are happening across the country. So we're, we're gonna do a deep dive into that. But before we get into talking about like the opioids itself, I think it's helpful to kind of give a little bit of a, a frame around who MPH is and how we're structured within state government because it is a little bit, um, it's a little more unique than some of the things that you guys maybe have seen you know, elsewhere. Um, so I think that, that foundation is helpful. Um, and then um, after we get through the opioid side of things, thought it might be helpful to touch on some of our other kind of key initiatives that we're working on and you know, working on operational dashboards and education and, and healthcare, et cetera. Um, and kind of wrap it up a little bit. Um, before I get started, just kind of helpful to kind of get a feel for the folks in the room. Um, how many people in the room are, would you, would you say you're aligned to state and local government? Okay. Um, how many say in the nonprofit space? Okay, a few light. Education, a couple hands. Okay. Um, any other big areas I'm missing? Okay. Fantastic. Healthcare? Very good. Well, it's just helpful to kind of get a feel for who's in the room when you're having these conversations. Um, so with that in mind, let me start off by kind of explaining a little bit about who we are as as an organization, as MPH. Um, fundamentally, and this is a, you know, a big, hairy, audacious, you know, principle here, but, you know, we were, we were really founded, you know, on the idea of being able to make government run better. Um, initially, it was intended to be more of an efficiency type of organization, uh, but I think we, as, an, as a state, realize that you can't really drive efficiencies if you don't have data. Um, is the data is what's going to help you kind of decide what are those right programs, what are the right services that you want to double down in. Um, and then, of course, you know, with all the, the, the recent improvements, you know, from a technology standpoint, you know, we have the ability to be able to leverage a lot of new tools that you didn't really have, you know, 20 years ago uh, that we need to be able to make sure that we're bringing into, uh, uh, bringing into improving government. The important thing that I always like to describe, though, is that MPH, um, we're the Management Performance Hub, um, we do not house any services. We don't deliver any direct programs. We don't have any clinicians, we don't have any police officers, we don't have any caseworkers. What we do have is we have a team of really, really smart data folks. Um, our team is um, 30 deep um, directly with the state, but then we also partner with universities and researchers and nonprofits in the community to be able to bring them underneath the overall umbrella to be able to tackle big, hairy, audacious problems you know, that, are, that are happening with the state. Um, so that's where you know, right now we serve, we have 70 agencies across the state of Indiana, we serve all of them. Um, we serve all of them in different capacities. A lot of it's with operational dashboards and key performance indicators. But even if you get away from those basic kind of KPIs for the organizations, um, there's about 22, 23 organizations across the state where we're working on key projects. Um, when it comes to the opioid efforts, there's 16 agencies that are coming together to share data. Uh, when it comes to a lot of the educational workforce programs, there's four agencies doing the same, and it kind of goes on and so forth. The idea of data and information, though, is not a new thing. Um, people have been looking for information to make better decisions for a long time. Just a matter of the, the days that we live in today, there's just a lot more data out there and there's a lot better tools to be able to pull that data together in order to be able to help solve those problems. Um, so if you kind of go all the way back to the 70s with the, the Fair Information Practice Act, I mean, people were looking at information. Now, they're probably in big old boxes that got delivered to your office, um, but you know, they're still looking for information to be able to make, make better decisions. Um, what we're blessed with, though, in the state of Indiana, and 
Um, I joke a lot about how Indiana doesn't, you know, we're not always leading the pack on everything, but when it comes to data and analytics, um, we are um, surprisingly um, leading the curve, you know, when it comes to what other states are doing from a data and analytics perspective. Our, um, our legislature um, passed the Indiana Open Data Bill um, just this past year, which effectively established the, the organization that I lead, the Management Performance Hub, as a formal agency in state government. We're separate from our technology function. Um, my role as Chief Data Officer is you know, um, directly appointed by the governor, and you know, we have that direct line of sight to be able to make sure that data is fundamental to everything we do. Um, but really the goal here is to be able to drive data-driven data -driven, data decision-making into you know, everything that our agencies do, and, and that's who we serve. So our mission, improve the lives of Hoosiers you know, with, with data, innovation, and collaboration. And I really like to hone in on that last word, though, with collaboration. We are uniquely positioned within state government to be able to pull together data from a number of different agencies, but then be able to package it in a way that we can get it in the hands of key folks who can then take it forward to drive you know, key, um, key um, improvements for the state. Um, so that collaboration piece is unbelievably critical, whether it's with other government agencies, I mentioned there's 70 agencies across the state of Indiana, or whether it's other organizations, whether it's nonprofits outside of state government, um, whether it's researchers, universities, you know, even for-profit entities for that matter. There's a lot of startups that can really leverage data from, from the state um, in order to be able to drive their, their economic development challenges. So it's kind of an interesting way where maybe you're not funding some startups, but you're able to get data in their hands to be able to improve their business process, business potential. Um, so the idea here is to empower data-driven decision-making, get open data out in the hands of folks who can do something with it, but we always gotta remember fundamentally at the baseline of this is that we gotta make sure that our data is, is secure, appropriately private, make sure it's suppressed at the right thresholds to be able to make sure there, there's no possibility of re-identification, that type of thing. So MPH exists really to be almost that, think about it as a center spoke of you know, with a lot of the other agencies around. We get to convene different agencies around bigger problems. We get to see how these problems intersect across agencies. We get to take these disparate data sets from various locations, pull them together, make sure that data talks to each other to be able to identify new insights. Um, and then, you know, obviously leverage our, our technology more in a central way, um, as opposed to 70 agencies all having broad, deep data and analytics teams and technologies. We can have it in one spot. Those agencies can plug into us. You'd be able to buy just enough or just a little bit in order to be able to serve their, serve their needs. Um, this is, um, I think this is obvious, um, but I think sometimes the picture is helpful to see. Um, when the agencies currently are there, you're looking at your world through your window, and you're only seeing the information that you see, so you're only making decisions based on your vantage point. But by being able to bring together all the different sources of data together, you're able to have a much broader window. You're able to see the problem much better um, in order to be able to tackle you know, the, the key challenges facing you know, our, our state. Um, I like to put this in there because we are um, we're, we're, we're a tech startup. We just happen to be in state, state government. Um, it sounds really backward sometimes because you never think about the concept of a tech startup in state government. I don't know if you can kind of see this like underlaid image. That's our office. Um, you know, we've got you know the touch screens in the front. You know, we've got our couches over there, and it, it has an innovative kind of feel. It's actually really interesting when you walk into the state house. You'll see this beautiful, opulent, old building, and then you'll walk into our office, and you're like, wait a second, these are very, very different. Um, that's done purposely. Um, we we pride ourselves on being an innovation hub, and the space matters. The space needs to be able to facilitate you know, that level of innovation. Um, but with that in mind, you know, when you think about tech startups, you gotta crawl, then you gotta walk, and then you gotta run. And we're very much, very early in this path. Um, I do think that there are some really interesting stories that we're gonna get to share around some of our early successes, but I'd be fooling myself and others if I would say that we're anything beyond the crawl phase today. Where I get excited, though, is when we're going to be walking and running, that's when we're really partnering with external agencies, external nonprofits, researchers, et cetera, be able to get data in their hands and be able to let them kind of run, take it forward. 
So that's kind of what this visual here is with the, with the baton pass. Think about a 1600 meter dash, you know, where you've got four people doing a 400 kind of meters, you know, at a time. Well, the initial 100 meters is the agencies or the external folks identifying the problem and establishing the use cases. Maybe the next 100 meters is you know, where we're actually pulling that data together to be able to make sure it talks to each other. Maybe the next 100 meters is us actually creating the visualizations and driving the insights that come from it. And then that last, you know, uh, you know, the final lap, the last 400, is getting that back in the hands of the agencies and the nonprofits who can then take that forward and improve their services, improve their programs, deliver better service for, for our state. Um, so without that partnership, without that handoff, you're making a lot of really interesting data sets available, but it's kind of like a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to hear it and didn't did make a sound. Same type of thing here. If you make data available and no one uses it, did you really make data available? Um, so just um, being, being here at Tableau, I thought some of, the, you know, some of our technology stack would be, would be potentially interesting to folks here. Obviously, we're, we're a Tableau shop, but you know, we have CCAN for our, um, for our open data portal. Um, that's how we're sharing data sets you know, with the outside world. Uh, we use R and Python for a lot of our ETL work. You know, we have you know, um, Esri for a lot of our uh, GIS work, et cetera. Um, so our team itself, just to kind of give you a feel for kind of you know, how we're organized, you know, we've got our tech side you know, from infrastructure, ETL, and BI. Um, we have data scientists that we contract with, you know, with uh, third parties because it's not always the easiest to bring in a data scientist on a state salary, um, to be frank. Um, so it's helpful to kind of partner, and that's where also the, the key universities and researchers come in because they're able to bring visiting fellows, visiting faculty in who bring high-level experience and, and insight, um, but they're effectively doing it for free because you're able to pay them with data. If they can come in and work shoulder to shoulder with us, we can unlock all this information. They're gonna be able to you know, deliver next, you know, next level results, be able to drive the outcomes that they're looking to drive, publish you know, in the journals that they're looking to publish in, um, but they don't always have access to that information. MPH you know, allows that to be facilitated. And then we have our group here called the Directors of Engagement Analytics. Uh, we call them our DEAs. A um, little bit of a difference from a DEA that you would probably think of. Uh, but uh, our DEAs, um, they're very sector-based. Think about it as our business liaisons uh, based on a specific sector. So there's a number of agencies across state government that are in health and human services and in public safety and education. We have a person who focuses on each of those areas. They go out, they engage with those groups. They're the ones who have the ability to understand what those key challenges are with those, with those agencies and then bring them to us. We don't have any direct challenges you know, immediately. We go out and we work with the agencies, we figure out what their key challenges are, then we bring them in and we work on them. And then we have a project management team. You know, obviously we're delivering a lot of projects, so we wanna make sure that we're meeting our customers' expectations, you know, making sure that we, um, you know, we're on schedule or on budget, um, and, and then make sure we have happy customers, right? So, so with that, um, that kind of gives a little bit of hopefully a background about kind of who the organization is, how it was founded. Um, and so let's dive into um, some of the work that we're doing on the opioid side of things. Um, if you've been hiding under a rock for, for the last um, months and years, um, there's an opioid problem happening in this country. Um, there's uh, um, obviously in the Midwest um, where we're, we're impacted more and than some of the coasts. Um, but. Uh, um, it, this, is not a, this is not a problem that's not impacting any of the 50 states, um, but, but Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, I mean, these states are, you know, um, are overwhelmingly impacted, you know, comparison. Um, if you look at whether it's number of overdoses, the number of deaths, I mean, these numbers have just gone through the roof. Um, specifically in Indiana, um, we led the country in pharmacy robberies in 2015 and 2016. When you consider that our population is, you know, a tenth of what California's is, but we're leading. Uh, we're leading, you know, I'm you know, a sixth of what California is, but we had more pharmacy robberies than they did. They did. Um, that obviously kind of tells you that there's a problem going on here. Um, there's a county, um, Scott County, which is about a, a mile, uh, about an hour south of Indianapolis. They had a, um, a really um, they had a, a public health emergency um, based on HIV outbreaks um, due to intravenous drug use predominantly. Um, that was a major news story across the state, but also nationally as well. And I mean, the point being, this is a, it's a huge problem. Um, you know, when you, when you think about you know, a lot of the, 
the folks that kind of get into public service, you often are coming in with the idea of improving health, improving education, improving workforce, improving the overall conditions. I bet the first thing that you sign up for when you're looking to do those jobs isn't that, hey, I want to tackle the opioid epidemic. You know, that's not what people generally sign up for. I know our governor, when you know, he put it as one of his five pillars, that wasn't something he wanted to do. It's something that you have to do. Um, so um, when our governor took office, first day, he, he signed an executive order, which established um, the role of exec, basically the drugs are, uh, but the is the executive director for drug prevention, treatment, and enforcement, and identified a gentleman by the name of Jim McClellan, who previously ran the Goodwill um, organization, you know, within the state of Indiana. Um, so once he came on board, um, Jim partnered with us um, to be able to establish what, what we call our drug data working group, um, which brought together 16 state agencies underneath a standard MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, uh, with the idea of being able to facilitate data sharing between these groups to get a better vision around the overall challenges. Um, so with that, you, a handful of those agencies that were brought in are listed here on the left. I mean, everyone from social services to state police to Homeland Security to our professional licensing agency, which is where our PDMP, uh, uh, prescription drug uh, monitoring program, that's, you know, that's where that lives. Um, so a number of agencies come together sharing data to be able to get a better, better grasp of their overall problem. But then the other point here, and is there's a lot of public organizations who are also very tied into this effort. So we've got all these kind of key researchers, and, um, and actually um, when Josh takes over here in a, in a couple slides, he's gonna show a video of, of what um, Indiana University is gonna be doing on this. They literally pledged yesterday that they're gonna invest $50 million you know, in, uh, in the effort to curb you know, um, opioids around the state, and um, so you get to see some of that here momentarily. Um, there are, the way we went through this process though is we, we reached out with these agencies when we're pulling data together, we didn't want to just pull the data together and then kind of just see what came out the other end. We wanted to actually start with those key outcomes in mind. What are, what, if you start with the end in mind and you work your way backwards, then you could be a little bit more surgical, a little bit more tactical regarding the data sets that you're actually pulling together, the visualizations you're creating. No reason to create a visualization that no one's gonna look at, no one's gonna do anything with. But let's figure out what are those key outcomes you're trying to drive and let's work our way backwards. Um, so one of the key, um, one of the use cases that kind of hopefully kind of shows the story here is um, our Division of Mental Health and Addiction underneath our Social Services Administration group. Um, they were given the, um, they were basically chartered to establish five new drug treatment facilities around the state. Um, and fundamentally, they were just trying to figure out where to put them. Um, you got to figure out, you, you can put them in a lot of different places and it's going to make an impact, but you want to be able to figure out where it's going to make the biggest impact. Um, and by being able to pull this data together, what they would have had is through social services, they would have known you know, a lot of the mental health challenges, they would have known where the facilities are, but they would not have known where opioids were, um, where people were overdosing, because that information oftentimes is with Homeland Security. They would have known where people are showing to the emergency rooms, as that would have been with the Department of Health. They would have known what drugs were being confiscated you know, out in, the, in the community, because that would be with state police. They wouldn't know what drugs there were, because that was also through state police, through the forensics labs. They wouldn't know where drugs were being prescribed you know, across the state, because that's through professional licensing. The list goes on and on. But the idea is you pull that together, you're able to create those hot spots, you're able to identify the, the locations where um, there, was, there isn't a treatment facility, uh, but then also where there's bigger challenges. And the part that um, actually was eye-opening to me, and I was really surprised about this, we thought we were doing this fully with the idea that we were helping them identify where to put these locations, um, which is still the majority of this, but the part that was fascinating was Everybody agrees that drug treatment facilities are important, but nobody wants it in their backyard. Think about that for a moment. It's crazy, right? But nobody wants it in their backyard. This data, this information, not only does it help you identify where it should go, it helps you sell why you should go there. Um, and that was a really powerful you know, takeaway that none of us even fully realized until we started getting into this. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Josh, who's going to go through more of the fun stuff, actually uh, get into Tableau, show you some of the dashboards, show you the video with what I use doing, and then I'll take you back over here momentarily. Great. Thanks, Darshan. Thank you.
see if I can make this go away now. I'm just going to have a seat over here, actually. <laughs> So uh, Darshan kind of laid the groundwork for, for some of the data, and, and we'll get into a little more specifics here and show you some of the things that we've been working on. Um, so this is a series of, of different visualizations we put together for, uh, for Jim McClelland, our, our Executive Director of Prevention, Treatment, and Enforcement. Um, we've just recently launched a new uh, statewide website, uh, in.gov backslash recovery, to be that holistic spot where folks can go. Uh, to get information about uh, about the drug epidemic, to get resources for assistance and help, uh, and to be a one-stop shop for uh, pointing people in the right direction, whether it's researchers, people who are publicly interested, or people who are, are suffering from a substance use disorder currently. Uh, so we put a series of, of public-facing dashboards together um, that are, are on that website um, that we'll walk through here. Uh, so the first one we're going to look at is going to be the prescription rates. So Darshan was talking about our prescription drug monitoring program uh, and, and that being our professional licensing agency has a lot of PII in it. So we've worked and partnered really close with the subject matter experts there uh, to be able to leverage more of that data. Um, our internal facing dashboards are, are much more uh, detailed and operational than, than some of these public facing ones. But unfortunately, we can't uh, give a ton of insight into, into all of those uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but I wanted to be able to show you some of the data that, that we are working with and, and how it's being presented out and, and talk to you more about the things that we're doing behind the scenes as well. Uh, so we can look at our prescription rates here, and, and this is a, a good story to tell across the board here. Is back in the, the, the mid-2000s, we were seeing quite a, a higher level of prescription rates per 100 residents. Uh, so 106 opioid prescriptions per 100 residents by county um, and across the state. Some counties higher than others. Uh, you know, you get down here, here's Scott County that Darshan was just talking about. Uh, yeah, that's 2.39 prescriptions per person of opioids. That's, that's pretty insane. Um, but we came up into, into to, so one of the great cool things if you're a data nerd like me, uh, as you start plugging through this stuff, you start to catch these anomalies and then you get to ask why. And not only, I wasn't a data nerd originally, I became a data nerd. I was really a policy nerd when I started at uh, state government. Um, so it's something that's kind of grown on me, but be able, to be able to look at uh, how, data, how data is showing what impacts of policy and how things have changed over time. So one of the anomalies that, that, that we identified early on was between 2013 and 2014, we saw a pretty significant decrease uh, in the prescription rates and the number of prescriptions that were being subscribed. In the number of prescriptions, drug substances that were coming into our forensics lab, so those substances that were being seized in law enforcement engage engagements sent to the laboratory, identified as to what it is, whether hydrocodone or oxycodone, or any of the others that are out there. Um, so we saw a, an interesting in decrease there, and we'll touch on that data here in a second uh, as, as we get into the drug data. But that started us to ask why, uh, an anomaly in the data that, that kind of pointed us in direction. Um, so looking at those poisoning deaths, so this is from our health department, our vital records, there's some major data quality uh, challenges, I think is the nice way to put it, in terms of, of death records uh, and the information that's been stored and the way that it's changed. It's getting better, but, uh, but doctors are entering it, entering it, and sometimes their notes are a little choppy, or uh, there's a lot of different ways to kind of categorize things. Um, there's been a lot of research recently uh, produced about uh, undercounting of opioid-related deaths, uh, as, as a lot of researchers have gone back in through toxicology reports associated with deaths and identified deaths that were associated with an opioid overdose, but not uh, counted as that when it happened. Uh, another complication we find is that when you die, your, your cause of death from an opioid overdose is, isn't an opioid overdose, it's you stop breathing. Uh, the underlying causes are, are the ones that we're most concerned with. Uh, those are the ones that are going to have the more uh, pertinent information for this particular problem. So we've done a lot of work on the data side with that um, to get more real-time uh, information out of our systems. Uh, the official numbers come back from the CDC. Uh, they're about two years stale by the time they go through and they do all of their work uh, to get official numbers and, and to make those estimates. Uh, well, all that data originates down with us. We're the ones that send it up, so we should probably be leveraging it at home, uh, at least in the operational front, to be able to make some of these decisions. Uh, so if we go back into the same time period, back in 2008, we had 291 opioid deaths. Uh, and we can see, kind of as we, we come up through the years here, in the, mid, the, the late, uh, late 2000s, we, we really started to see the ramp up, and we'll see that when we look at some of the, the drug data earlier. In 2014, we're at 437. Uh, 
almost 500 in 2015, 757 in 2016 is, is the preliminary numbers. And keep in mind, those are uh, going to be undercounted. So we're, it's, it's a huge impact on, on life in, in the state of Indiana. It continues to grow. So even though we've seen in that 2013 time period uh, a reduction in the prescriptions going out per capita, uh, we're still seeing more opioid deaths. So that led us to lead. Oh yeah, the colors way better there. Uh, I was nervous about this one. The colors are a little pale on, on my screen, uh, but they're showing up really nice there. Uh, so that led us to look into really what are the drugs that they're identifying if they're able to identify specifics in those death records. So are people dying from you know, prescription overdose? Uh, or are they dying from heroin? Are they dying from synthetics? Are they dying from multiple drug toxicity? Uh, and the answer is yes, 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 all of the above. Uh, but we're starting to see more and more uh, synthetic opioids coming into the, into the reach here uh, in recent years in, in our vital records. We've seen it as well in our, our, our forensics laboratory data, which we'll switch over to here in a second. Um, and we've, we've, we've had some changes that have happened due to better reporting, but we've also had some changes because we, we've seen some new substances coming into the area and, and it, the market is starting to change. So looking at that kind of side by side, uh, you notice we have a lot of un, other or, or unspecified uh, opioids. Um, our heroin weights have, have really skyrocketed. Synthetics as well, multiple opioids. We had a, a little bit of a downtick and we're, we're raising right back up. Um, if we, we look at it into our, our total drugs, um, a lot of these are going to be with opioids or un, unspecified drugs. So that's another caveat that we get in these is we'll have uh, a drug, but it's an unspecified drug. They don't go through the full toxicology panel um, or multi-drug toxicities and, and the like. So it can be really difficult from, uh, from the medical standpoint to identify specifically what it is without running full panels on it. Uh, and a lot of that information doesn't, even if they do run, it doesn't come all the way up to the state level for reporting. So we're learning that uh, there's a lot we need to do in terms of education to get better data coming to the state to make decisions. Uh, but we're also learning how we can navigate our own data to, to get better information out of it by doing some, uh, some text analysis of different fields uh, to be able to identify that, by linking other information to it to look at EMS history for individuals that are showing up uh, in the death registry. And, and seeing what the history is there, uh, how many EMS runs were happening before the person passed away. Uh, is there an EMS history with some of these folks? Uh, was naloxone deployed? Um, so we're starting to, by bringing all the data into the one coordination point and leveraging it across different data systems that were traditionally separate, never linked, didn't ever talk to each other, uh, and the people that work in those systems didn't ever really get a chance to connect. Uh, so the information was never changing. And now that we have this great working group put together that uh, I, I co-chair with my partner from the governor's office, um, we're, we have our discussions around data, and we have our discussions around visuals like this, and, and all of those people are the, the subject matter experts and the data folks from those agencies, and it's driving a much better approach to, to holistically looking at what the problem is and what potential solutions are. So we'll get into a little more operational uh, dashboard here. So this is all going to be on our, our forensics laboratory data. So the, the great thing about this data, when I started working with state police on this back in 2014, I, I emailed our superintendent of state police, Doug Carter, and I said, Doug, we got some new BI tools, and I'd like to you know, visualize the heroin issue. Um, so he says, hey, I'll, I'll hook you up with somebody to get you some data. So in Indiana, we have uh, four state police forensics laboratories that service all of the state except for Marion County, where Indianapolis is located. Marion County has its own laboratory. Uh, fortunately for us, it's a retired trooper who runs that lab. So an email connection there uh, and got us a completely informal data sharing arrangement where they're sending us their data every month. Um, what's really awesome about this data is there's no identifiers in it. It just identifies with the substance submission. So it's just a service where a law enforcement or public safety entity would submit a substance. Uh, it would be given a lab ID number. They would do a gas chromatography on it. They would identify what that substance is and report it back. So no PII. Uh, so I can show you guys a lot more into this data than what we, uh, what we can with some of the other stuff. Um, but it does start to give us a proxy for what the supply is, and it does start to give us good longitudinal data because this goes back to the end of 1996 in what we've seen coming in and out of the laboratories. And a huge benefit of this uh, most recently is that we have a lot of new synthetics that are coming in that don't fall under the current, uh, current laws to be illegal substances. Uh, so that could be really complicated for law enforcement for the rest to deal with. So through our process of making this data more consumable, because it's coming in in these... Uh, 
these great chemical names over here, and drug chemists can't spell very well either, and they have like multiple names for the same stuff. So we're doing a lot of uh, quality cleansing and, and, and consumption enhancements to the data, um, but we're able to identify as we're doing classifications into the DEA groupings for these substances, new substances that aren't in our classification system, and it's spitting out an exception report, which we're sharing with our pharmacy board so they can get an emergency scheduled as quickly as possible. So rather than it taking a long time for the forensics lab to see it over and over again, finally making the connection through email back to the pharmacy board or going and talking to somebody there, it's happening now on a, on a fairly automated process. Uh, so we're, we're identifying when we had uh, U47700, which is a really nasty synthetic opioid come in. Uh, shortly after it entered Ohio, we were able to identify that in the system, notify the, the pharmacy board so they could get that on their emergency scheduling uh, list. Acrofentanyl was another one that was recent. Uh, furanyl fentanyl, uh, a lot of the fentanyl-like substances. Uh, so that's been a, a really positive uh, thing. It's kind of, we didn't ex ever expect for that to happen. It just kind of landed in our lap. We said, well, we can change information so much quickly and it's gonna have to make things move a lot faster. So uh, that was a, a real good success story from, from this. But uh, so looking into this geospatially is really important for us because we have different problems in different counties. Uh, as you can see over here on this side of the state, you see a lot of blue. So these are per capita. The size of the, of the, the pie is going to be the per capita rate. The different pieces of the pie are the different drug groupings. So blue is, is opioids. So we can see, just drop this off here real quick. Oh, I broke the link to that, didn't I? Yeah. Um, we can see that, that there's different, uh, different problems in different areas uh, where we're seeing a lot more opioid issues on this side of the state. We see a lot more methamphetamine issues and stimulant issues on, uh, on some of our western, uh, central western states and, and up in our northeastern states. Um, so it's not a one-size-fits-all problem. Darshan was talking about the HIV issue down in Scott County. Uh, Scott County has been experiencing a ton of issues with opioids, but some of the other drugs not as much. Um, so we need to target our, our efforts towards where we have the bigger opioid issues and watch how it's been traveling and where it's been moving within the state. Uh, before the mid-2000s, it was mainly in higher populated areas up in, in Gary by Chicago, Indianapolis, um, Evansville, uh, and it's really spread into some of the more rural and some of our poorer counties throughout the state. Uh, so this helps us get into to looking at some of this, uh, this information a little more uh, in detail. And you can see so these are our opioids here. Uh, so if you go back even farther than the, than the 2007 timeline, they're, they're, they're down even further. We can really see where they started to take off uh, here in the last, last several years. Yeah, so opioids as a whole. If we get into our specifics, um, if we want to look just at our opioids and see the substances that are in there. Remember I was talking about that 2013 timeline? You can see this big drop right here. So this is Vicodin, hydrocodone, very commonly prescribed. So I, we started to ask ourselves, what the heck caused that to happen? And talking with our pharmacy board, in December 2013, we enabled new prescribing uh, practices out of the pharmacy board promulgated to, to doctors. So that completely, you're seeing the effect of that policy. So it did drive that down. Unfortunately, we've seen increases in other substances that have came in to take its place. Um, but, but from a, being a policy nerd, and, I thought it was really interesting to be able to look back and see the impact of that policy in, in true numbers. Uh, not only in the numbers that we saw in prescription rates across the state, but also the illicit substances that were coming into labs. Um, stimulants are another one that we, we traditionally have pretty big problems with. You can see uh, uh, cocaine has really kind of trailed off since, uh, since several years ago. Uh, methamphetamine has, has been a pretty consistent problem in, in Indiana, um, but uh, heroin has been catching up in, in recent years. Um, also to keep in mind, this is, these are year-to-date numbers here, and there's a lag, so a substance has to be seized, has to come to the lab, has to be processed uh, before it's going to show up in the data. So there's a, there's a several month lag. But yeah, you can see all the different fun chemicals that you get to, uh, to deal with here, from MPPP to oxymorphone to a whole bunch of different fentanyls. Um, and that's really the one that, that's that's the scariest to, to me and, and the scariest to our law enforcement partners as well as fentanyl. Um, so if we, you look at where our fentanyls were, fentanyl submissions coming in the lab in the late two, uh, 2000 to 2010, 2011, we were seeing you know, low double digits um, coming into the labs. And then between 2013 and 2014, we had a dramatic increase. Um, that increase has continued into 2015, into 2016. And if you look down here at our, uh, at our forecast, 
uh, we're, we're going to continue to see that grow. If, uh, and this is, this is a great visual here about the dangers of, of fentanyl. So on the left here you have heroin and what a common lethal dosage would be for, for an, uh, an average sized adult, uh, 30 milligrams. Uh, so for fentanyl it's three, so it's a couple grains. Um, and we have street chemists out there that are upping their heroin batches with, with fentanyl. And it's really precision due to the, the volume there. Uh, and they're not you know, precision manners, so then we're getting hot loads or we're, uh, we're getting overdoses there. And then you get care fentanyl, which is even worse, um, and some of these other synthetics that are coming out. Uh, so when we deal with fentanyl, unlike in the medical community, which deals with fentanyl mainly in, in liquid format, which is stable, um, they're usually encountering it in powder format. Uh, so powder format, if you have a bag full of it, you can see two to three grains of salt. That bag has a hole in it. You squeeze it as you're picking it up. It goes airborne. That goes, hits your mucous mem membrane in your nose, and you go into a full-blown opioid overdose. Um, see, when it comes into our forensics laboratories, this is how we have to handle it. We shut down an entire lab. Uh, one person gets in full per, uh, personal protective equipment. One person stands on the outside of the lab with a phone ready to dial 911, and we have multiple doses of naloxone on hand in our forensics laboratories. Uh, that's just how dangerous this stuff is. Um, so I've been tweaking the forecast here today. This is after a couple of cool sessions. Um, so I know I would ask, you know, oh, you got the forecast up there, but how, how cool is it? How good is it? Uh, we're actually getting a really good uh, forecast model out of this, looking at the months for, for the past couple of years. Um, so you're, if you're looking at the Mesa of 0.37, that's pretty, pretty stellar. Um, so compared to a naive model, uh, we're eliminating 63% of the year uh, with this forecast model. Um, so that's scary, though. I mean, what, what Darshan was talking about earlier was the big investment. This is the highest priority uh, on our governor's list, uh, and it definitely isn't something they, that he campaigned on early. Uh, but traveling throughout the state, talking to the different folks that have been affected by this, uh, it became priority number one to, to tackle. So. Uh, that's that's the top of our agenda. It's top of my agenda uh, on an everyday basis. Uh, I never wanted to really do this, but uh, it can get a little depressing. But when we know that we're, we're we're leveraging the best information we can to help make an impact, and I hope that I can come back next year and talk to you guys about this and show you that that forecast model is busted. That's my goal. Um, so that's that's where we're at. Yeah. Can you want to show that video of like what I sure. Yeah, right. I'll show the video and then we'll handle some questions. Yeah, so this was announced yesterday, actually. Maybe. While we're waiting for this thing. Sure. Um, so, so you're, when we're talking about the impact of policy on the, and seeing it in the data and going back and talking to them and, and getting that input and seeing that, and that's, that is exciting. Um, I also was looking at the data that you're showing about the number of samples coming in. Um, and of course, your mind starts going, okay, but are those, is that because there's more arrests or that's more, you know? So you guys could go down a rabbit hole with all these different agencies of data trying to predict what, or trying to understand, not predict, but understand what those things impacting the data were. Where do you, how where do you draw the line? <laughs> That's, that hole yeah, so, so really when, when we started working with this, it's, it's, was, we were working with the one data set with the forensics laboratories and looking at that. And we started thinking about there's, the situation out there is more than just a law enforcement issue. It's a health and human services issue. It's a, there's so many different people that are impacted and involved. How can we start filling in the pie so that we can get a better view of what's going on? So we have some other models that we've actually looked at uh, law enforcement resources by county to see if that could be an impact. We've talked to law enforcement folks. We know that there's some counties that have really good uh, multi-jurisdictional drug task force that are catching a lot of people. But when you normalize it over time and when you look at it with the other data, the other prescription data, with you looking at it with our, our overdose uh, data and information, it helps to paint that picture. Um, but we rely solely on our subject matter experts to help drive those questions because I don't know. Uh, I'm not an expert in that. I, I'm, I'm a data nerd. I do the data nerd stuff. So we rely heavily on the subject matter experts, our epidemiologists from, from our health department, from the research arms, from the, our, our state troopers and folks that are doing uh, research on that in their realm and, and the investigators uh, to all of these different, different entities. So to, to drive that discussion, 
Uh, we're supporting the decisions with, with data and putting it together, but we're relying on them to help ask the right questions so we can get the data to support that decision making. Sir? So a lot of your subject matter experts have uh, long-standing uh, biases in terms of the particular government agencies they work for. That's why we put them all in the same room at the same time. So it, it's really good. <laughs> So that was one of the key, key reasons that Jim McClellan was, was appointed and why, why Governor Holcomb created that position is to create a central coordinating point to focus on prevention, treatment, and enforcement. Um, so there, he's looking at it holistically. We're supporting those decisions there, and he's coordinating the approach for the entire state. So uh, it is starting to change. Um, there is starting to be more coordination. The resources are going to be more coordinated, uh, and, the, and the charge is going to be led from the top. So that's really how you change the game there, is you've got to get someone with the executive leadership to do that. You've got to get someone who's interested in the data. And Jim was appointed on, on day one uh, and was in my office on day two. Uh, I said, hey, I hear you got data. I need your help. Uh, so that's where, where we've been driving discussion there. But uh, it, it is a continuous discussion. It's a continuous engagement around, around data and information. And uh, on, on this issue, there's, there's, not, uh, there's some folks out there that, that uh, are yelling and screaming about certain different things. But the folks that are on the ground uh, in, the, in the state level that are working in these programs that are taking it head on don't have those same public facing attitudes that we see in some of those other situations. Let's just say let's 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 play the video real quick. We've got a few more slides, and then we'll make sure we I'll fly through those. So we have a few minutes at the end to be able to ask a few more questions. Nick and Jack were 18 months apart. They were a year behind each other in school, and I would say that they probably were best friends. They played hockey since they were about three years old. They played their last four years of hockey together. Nick and Jack had gone to a party um, the next morning. I walked into Jack's room and was talking to him. Didn't really get a response from him, so I shook him to wake him up, and that's when he didn't wake up. I checked his pulse and checked his respirations, and of course there was none. And I um, picked him up and I initiated CPR and then called for 911. Nick was in the basement with some of his friends. They had gone to awaken Nick to let him know, and Nick um, was lifeless as well. They were underage drinking, and they also had experimented with some opioids. They made a choice to take one of the pills and didn't wake up the next morning. I still can't believe that they would make choices that like they did that night. This can happen to anybody. No families are untouchable. The challenge posed by addiction in Indiana today is enormous and unprecedented. Opioid abuse is at an all-time high. Abuse of other substances is rising at an alarming rate. Alcoholism continues to shatter families, and the size of the problem is rivaled only by its complexity. Now's the time to act for our state, for our communities, and for the people we love. That's why Indiana University's Grand Challenges program is partnering with Governor Eric Holcomb and his administration to tackle Indiana's addiction problem head on. Overcoming this crisis will take a complex, far reaching plan. Oh, we got about halfway there. What's that? Yeah, let's give it like 10 more seconds, otherwise we can all send the link out. You guys can watch it later. Well, 
how about I let this load the rest of the way in Darshan? You can go through the yeah. rest of the. Uh, <coughs> Sounds good. The rest of the PowerPoint slides. Well, I'll kind of fly through these because I'm sure there's going to be questions, and the last thing I want to do is um, present this stuff and ah, shoot. As opposed to answering the questions that you guys are here for, um, there's no real, um, there's not a really great transition to go from uh, talking about opioids to other programs because it's you, you see the the lives impacted, you know, with, from an opioid standpoint. Um, but nonetheless, I thought it would be helpful to kind of just briefly touch on some of the other projects we are doing um, because we are going to have a lot of data sets that are going to be out there, and we're constantly looking for folks who are interested and. In, pulling that information down. If you want to lend your insights to it and share back with us, and uh, we would love for you guys to do that. So I'm going to just kind of quickly fly through a few things that we're doing. Um, our social services group came to us with, um, with basically 27 terabytes of Medicaid claims data. It said, help us get in the hands of people who can do something with it. Improve the health and wellness of our population. We've got all this data. We think there's good stuff in here. Help us get in the hands of people who can actually make heads and tails out of it and do that. So that's really fundamentally kind of the big challenge here. And we went out and we talked to a number of, um, again, with the idea of the end in mind. We went out and talked to hospital systems, like in our community, you know, like Eskenazi Health, the Community East. There's like rural health partners. There's telehealth organizations. There's, you know, um, healthcare transportation companies. You know, that all these areas that if you can actually get this data in their hands, it's amazing how they can optimize their services um, to be able to get the right person in the right place at the right time. You know, if you're talking about Eskenazi, which has a large Medicaid population, if you're able to identify like the zip codes that have the highest, you know, ER visits coming from there, they can target their next urgent care facilities in those spots or extend the hours in those areas. The, the, I, the opportunities are endless, but the idea, again, is to be able to get data in the hands of folks who can drive better decisions. Um, but with this, we're actually doing a, um, we're doing a challenge um, with this, not this Saturday, but the week after in Indianapolis. There's the HIMSS conference. Um, a number of you guys in healthcare probably know, but it's the Health Information Management Systems and, um, so Systems and Solutions, I believe. Um, basically, it's, it's healthcare IT folks coming together to be able to tackle big problems. We've got 50 teams that are already signed up to basically take this data, hack away with it, and give us, you know, give us their ideas and kind of sparks around what we can do with it. Um, and you know, so obviously we're excited about it. And I'd be blown away if at least like 30 or 40 of those are probably not done in Tableau, right? So I mean, it just kind of fits into the overall kind of prism that we're touching. Um, next one is Crash. This was a partnership with state police, Department of Transportation. We were able to bring together crash data across the state along with traffic patterns, um, construction zones around the state, um, along with census data, weather conditions, to be able to identify and predict um, where accidents are likely going to occur uh, with the idea that law enforcement can better position themselves to be able to, one, reduce the likelihood of the accident, or two, respond quicker if and when it actually happens. Um, the third one is probably a little bit more pie in the sky kind of vision, but hey, you got to get some shots on goal and maybe one will hit um, where you know, we want to be able to get this in the hands of citizens. Like, can you imagine, like right now you go to Google Maps and you figure out the path of fa that's fastest. Um, we're already talking to Google, talking to Waze, talking to some of these companies, trying to figure out if, I know Waze is part of Google, but they still run separately. Sometimes it's easier to work through the entrepreneurial side of things um, with the idea of being like, hey, maybe this path is two minutes longer, but it's going to be 100x safer. You know, those are kinds of things that, we're, that we have kind of on our kind of radar, kind of looking ahead. The, the, the crash map itself is on the top left. You know, white is the areas with the lowest amount of accident likelihood. Blue is the next level up, then yellow, then red. And it's not like 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x. It's like 1x, 10x, 40x, 160x. You know, kind of give you an idea of, like, to be able to kind of redirect. Um, but whatever you measure, you will improve. And uh, basically, um, what state police found was between 2014 and 15, fatalities across the state of Indiana from accidents went up by 7.5%. Um, so the goal here is let's reduce the number of accidents because we'll likely be able to reduce the number of fatalities. And so really what we're tracking here is the, the, you know, the number of accidents that are occurring you know, month over month. And, and just in, oops, sorry, just in the uh, first you know, four months, because again, with the lag and everything with some of the data, um, just in the first four months, we've seen about an 8-9% reduction in accidents year over year. Um, so what you measure, you will improve, and you know, getting the tool out there in the hands of folks who can use it. Um, on the education side of things, uh, we're, we have a 
you may have heard of like SLEDs, state longitudinal data systems, um, where it's a longitudinal data record where we've been able to pull together data from K through 12 from our Department of Education, higher ed um, from universities and colleges, along with workforce, um, you know, whether it's employment and wage data, but then also tying in with social services. And we have a longitudinal record with this information in it. So there's key researchers and nonprofits um, like Goodwill, I mentioned earlier, um, they have consumed this data. They're looking at their workforce programs and figuring out how they can better target you know, the right people for the right program. So this information is feeding that, you know, those kind of, those targeted efforts. Um, so this information is ready and available. Um, you know, we have data sharing agreements on our website. Literally, you can sign on to it and get this information and be able to, to identify you know, opportunities to improve. Um, this is one example of an organization, um, Regional Educational Laboratory Midwest. Uh, they're basically looking at predictors of early college success based on financial aid. Um, the idea being, what lever can you pull that's going to be able to drive the outcomes that you're looking to drive? And, and that's what researchers are, are heavily focused on. It kind of gives you an idea of like the different data sets that come together on it. But I'll fly through that. Um, and then KPIs. Um, every agency has uh, key performance indicators. We want to be able to make sure we're offering good, good government service at good value. And you know, KPIs are one way to be able to show you know, performance of agencies. Um, the one that's uh, helpful to kind of maybe kind of paint this picture a little bit. Um, the, my, my wife is from Ohio, and she talks about how terrible her her DMV um, um, kind of experience was. In Indiana, it's the BMV, it's the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Um, and our BMVs are actually reasonably all right. Um, it's surprising, like it's, it's changed in comparison to where it's been. And you know, they have targets where they expect your experience time to be under 15 minutes. They expect customer satisfaction at 97% or higher. Um, and they track all this stuff and they measure it, they, they push it. Um, I mean, you're not talking about hour-long visits, you know, over at the BMV in theory. Um, I mean, I'm sure on a one-off basis, you know, there's there's always things that you can find, but but that's the point. Is let's figure out what's going to be the KPIs that are going to matter the most for our for our citizens. Let's measure it. Because if we measure it, we will improve it. <clears throat> and this kind of gives you the idea of like. So this is basically um, the way that we just you know, just demonstrate and show on our website to be able to again be transparent and be able to share that information with our citizens. Um, so with that, um, I mean, like I said, I wanted to make sure I did this quickly so it gives ourselves a few minutes, but uh, we partner with agencies. You know, that when it comes to opioid efforts, we're bringing together a lot of agencies to tackle it. Well, when it comes to specific agencies, you know, to be able to get their data in the hands of key partners to be able to take the state's initiatives forward, that's like a great way to extend your reach without, you know, um, increasing your overall budgets, you know, for the state. Um, and then obviously working with agencies of KPIs to be able to continue to drive better service. Uh, but then we also work with community interests. We want to get data unlocked from the state and in the hands of folks like yourselves who could do something positive with it. Um, that has to do with the public data sets, whether it's in Medicaid, education, or workforce. That's just the beginning. Um, our our public-facing portal um, goes live on Monday. Um, so we have a new website and a new public-facing portal, all that go live this coming Monday, in.gov slash data. Um, so you can, you, can, uh, you can see, you know, whatever we have available and literally just download it. If, if you have to have a data sharing agreement, it's right there. You fill it out online. It goes through form stack and it's approved and you get access to data. Um, we do a number of these civic hacks. I mentioned the, the Medicaid data challenge and then, of course, building partnerships, but want to make sure that we have the end in mind. And so we're not just building data sets for the sake of creating data sets. Um, so it's kind of what we do. Um, we've got about six or seven minutes. Um, any questions? Yeah. I'm curious where 12 step programs uh, factor into this equation. You know, you're collecting data from them on, on the efficacies or, or, or the volume of, say, communities in particular areas. So we're working with Pew Charitable, Charitable Trust right now in terms of getting more information about that because there isn't reporting from a lot of those, uh, those nonprofit or, or other community-based driven things. Um, but we are, this is really a holistic approach that we're taking across the board. We know that the gold standard on this is serious medication-assisted treatment, uh, long-term inpatient with lots of cognitive behavioral therapy and the like. 
Um, we know that we've got to do a lot of stuff on the economic front. And we've, we're, we're growing uh, our, our business front all the time in Indiana. We're attracting a lot of businesses. Uh, you know, they're starting to call it Indianapolis and in, in Indiana, the, the Silicon Prairie. Uh, we have a lot of tech startups that are starting in Indianapolis. Uh, Infosys is bringing over 2,000 high paying jobs to, to Indianapolis. Uh, Salesforce just put their branding on the tallest building in the city. Uh, so we have, we have a lot of activity that's going going on there. But if we don't have a workforce that's healthy, uh, if we don't have a, a population that can, can fill those jobs, we're going to be in trouble. Um, so we're focusing on it from really all those fronts, and we're going to work with all those different entities that, that can get those information. Um, but the information that we do have on different medications, is we're, we're continuing to improve that as well. Uh, there's just there's some federal uh, limitations on anything that has to do with substance abuse. Um, and, and mental health, which complicates significantly, like it goes, it's a carve out above and beyond HIPAA. Uh, it, it complicates significantly the ability to leverage that data with any other data or to do, leverage that data to do any real meaningful, impactful studies on. Um, but we're working now with, with more researchers, uh, a researcher, uh, Brad Ray from, from IU, uh, who's done a ton of this work and has worked with a, a ton of medical data, will actually be joining our team through an interchange agreement uh, so that he can come in and work with, within our walls, which helps us get through some of those situations. Uh, uh, we, we've got a lot of different partners, uh, and, and the big announcement from IU yesterday is going to bring some more resources to bear. Um, but a lot of the data, it, it just doesn't exist anywhere. So we got to start collecting it. So a lot of the data that you're talking about kind of already exists that you're working with. Sure. Yeah, so um, I always talk about how there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there, though. Um, when it comes to state and local government, you don't have to be at the forefront on the edge of technology and, and, and getting every kind of possible sources out there. There's so much information that's readily available, and we haven't done enough with that. So I'm not actually even worrying about a lot of those things yet because there's so much stuff right in front of us that we need to grab, we need to tackle, we need to be able to drive the basics, you know, which will then allow us to kind of go to those next steps. But um, really, that's where we partner with our agencies. I mean, if there's times where the upstream data, you know, needs to be, there needs to be a better kind of collection methodology or there's certain information that's not being collected, that's where we talk, we have a partnership with them and be able to figure out what we can tweak and so, so you can zig instead of zag in order to be able to, you know, bring better data in. But for the most part, a lot of this is just a lot of data out there already. It's a matter of just pulling it together and, and getting some early wins. <laughs> sure. Oh, I'm so jealous of every state that has an all payer database. The fact that we don't. Obviously, if we're talking about specifically kind of within the health side of things, uh, we do have a, a number of key resources in Indiana where, um, like if you guys are familiar with like the Regan Street Institute, they're the ones who piloted and you know, they, they invented basically the, the electronic, medic, electronic medical record. You know, that was kind of born out of the Regan Street Institute of Indiana. Um, and those are types of things where that's extended to a lot of our information, kind of health information exchanges. Um, so, the IHI and MIN, which is the Michigan Health Information Exchange, there's a lot of health-related data that's within those EMRs, you know, that's all out there that, that we're working with those partners to be able to consume that data also within the walls of the state. That's where there's partnerships with those groups where you can work underneath the statute and the, and the, um, the, the, what we've been granted kind of via the legislature, but we can bring those parties in bring their data in, we can combine it with the data sets that we already have available to be able to get even a better vision into you know, the overall challenges. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't solve the problems regarding the broader all-payer kind of uh, claims data. I mean, when I have Medicaid claims data, that, that shows me 25% of the population. You know, we can talk to SEMA and others at the feds and you know, try to get some of the Medicare data. That brings you another quarter of the population. When I'm looking at half of it, I'm still not looking at the 50% that's commercial claims, you know, which unfortunately is, um, 
it's just not there right now. So you, you start with what you got, um, and I think the, the exchanges of that data coming in is, is probably the, the, the next step. Yes. We'll talk to you more after the session if you want to. <laughs> so the video's loaded, I'll, I'll kick it off oh. here, and, uh, and we're about out of time, and if anyone wants to talk more. Attacking the drug yeah, we'll epidemic is a key focus of my administration. It starts with equipping and training those on the front lines of this crisis. We're focusing on prevention, early intervention, better training, and certification programs so more health professionals can help fight this epidemic. We must understand and respond more effectively to the root causes of this problem. We're taking a strategic approach and improving the use of data to reduce the prevalence of substance use disorder and help those who have an opioid addiction recover and become or return to being productive, contributing members of their communities. To do this, we're pulling together the best resources this state has to offer. We are attacking this crisis on all fronts. We are taking action to reduce the availability of opioids and provide Hoosiers with more treatment and prevention programs. We need to understand not only the science behind addiction, but also the policy and economic issues that affect it. If we're going to break the cycle of addiction, we must address economic opportunity, jobs, and community development. It will take teamwork, including local communities across our state. Working together, we are expanding partnerships and introducing new resources that will help end this crisis. These areas of focus will reach families across our state and help those who need it most. Critical change, life-saving change, so that Hoosiers everywhere know that help and hope is on the way. Where there's hope, there's a chance to save lives. When IU was looking to establish this broader grain challenge, there's I don't know, there are probably half a dozen different groups within. Uh, if you guys are familiar with like obviously universities, every school is kind of runs like a separate company, and you know they each of them have a different research groups. They have um, different people that are going to impact this overall challenge. Each of them reach out to us directly because again we have the data, we have the information. If we can partner with these guys, we can get it in their hands. Um, it's only going to enable you know their work better, and and that's really the way we look at ourselves. You know, we're not the the driver or the solution to these problems. We're an enabler, we're a facilitator, but we're only as good as the agencies and the partners that we work with. So with that, yeah, I think we're out of time, but um, yeah, we'll stick around. If you guys have this is a nice small group overall. So if anybody has any direct questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thank you.